and hit record. Okay, awesome. So thank, thank you everyone for coming again. Again, my name is Taylor Simone. I'm one of the network coordinators. I support steering committee, noise and working group alongside my brilliant colleague, Victoria Barnett. Um, and we are here to hear from Mike Harrington, one of our members who just recently had a member story and are really excited about it. So I'm just gonna start off by reading Mike's bio and then I'm gonna hand it over to them to talk about their practice. So Mike is responsible for supporting the work of the Tishman Center by li liaising with offices and departments throughout the university and implementing projects that advance the new school's commitment to sustainability and environmental justice. Before joining the TEDC team, he worked at Elevate Energy, organizing around creating equity and energy efficient, efficiency markets, and started as the chair of another environmental nonprofit, the Delta Institute, and has helped manage an organic food bank garden for people with compromised immune systems. He also served on the associate board of the Green City Market, Chicago's largest farmer's market. He obtained his master's degree in environmental policy and sustainability management from the New School and has a bachelor's of science from the University of Illinois at Urban, Urbana Champaign in uh, psychology with a specialization in industrial slash organizational psychology and was a 2019 Urban Design Forum front a forefront fellow and is a member of the board of directors for the Delta Institute, again, an environmental nonprofit. Mike is also a part of the DJN communications team. Um, and when I hand it over to Mike, I'm also going to paste an agenda for y'all to look over. Uh, this will go over what we're going to get into in today's session. And yeah, you can take the floor, Mike. Thank you. Oh, thank you for such a nice. Um intro that was that sounds like i like a lot <laughs> um but it really isn't but i'm really um yeah i'm really glad all of you were able to join and, and i'm glad that you're uh, hopefully interested in the work that i'm doing uh, so i'll just talk a little bit about myself for a few minutes uh and the work i'm doing and if you have any questions like please feel free to jump in um either using the chat or or on um muting uh so yeah i'm i'm um and I'll just talk a little bit about my work uh, and how I got to where I am. So as in the, as the bio states, I work at the new school in New York, if anyone is familiar with that place. Um, and it has a very well-known design school, Parsons. And um, while I, I think I said in my interview that I'm not, I don't have any sort of formal design training, but that's not exactly true uh, because at the new school, whatever program you do, you are gonna have design teachers working with you. And um, yeah, I, I'm also, I will have a design certificate from there coming up soon. So um, I guess I will have that. But uh, my background is I'm from Chicago, um, South side of Chicago. And uh, after college, I went off for a little bit and then I came back and got, really got into doing sustainability work um, through doing um, an AmeriCorps program. Uh, AmeriCorps is basically like civil service. And that's how I got my intro introduction to, um, to, to do, uh, environmental work. And I became a community organizer soon after that. And uh, in my community organizing work, I had to learn a lot. Uh, we did actually work with design principles there. So I think that's where I first um, encountered that. And because I am from a I would guess, I would say a, a, an oppressed group that um, I really felt it was it was important that people from groups like that that are really bearing the, the impacts of climate change and so many other things are not only represented in the, in the field, but to, um, but to also like have a better understanding and a, and a better voice. So a lot of my work concentrated on reaching out to people like me uh, from my neighborhood and from the part of the city I'm from. And I've always been very, um, yeah, just concerned with justice. Uh, so after that, I went to grad school at the New School. Uh, and I work at a place called the Tishman Environmental uh, Environment and Design Center, uh, and I can put the link in here. Uh, wait, I'll I'll put it in there later, but I'll put the link in there. But basically, 
we are a part of the new school that works at the intersection of design, policy, and the climate crisis. So we, um, we like our, for instance, my director, my two directors, one is a designer, Joel Towers, who is an architect. The other one is Ana Baptista, who is an environmental activist and professor. Uh, they're both professors, but we really try to, in our work, to be very mindful of the communities that we work with. And we have ev everything that we do focuses around uh, justice, um, justice principles. Like for instance, we use the Hamas principles. Uh, is that, are, you all, is it, are you all familiar with the Hamas principles at all? Or does anyone, has anyone heard of them? Um, so the Hamas principles for open, um, for, sorry, oh, uh, that someone else is someone familiar with them? Oh, I thought you thought you're gonna pop up. Yet. Um, they're called the Hamas Principles for Democratic Organizing, um, and they're basically a framework that is useful. And I'll put the link in the in the chat too when I get to it. But it's a really useful framework for working with communities. Um, for instance, we do research. That's part of what we do. And uh, for our research practice, we don't go reaching out to to people that want to research. We, we mostly work with community groups, but they come to us um, and they ask, can, we, can, you, can you basically help us or can you assist us with this? Because we don't see ourselves as these experts, like the people in the community are the real experts. So um, we, we are there just offering our, our skills and research and we just happen to be connected to a university. Um, and the other work, and I'm going to share, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it over to you all soon, but the other work that I do um, is mostly around policy, a mixture of policy design and climate stuff. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, it was mentioned in the, Taylor, Taylor mentioned in my intro that I was part of the Urban Design Forum's um, Forefront Fellowship. The Urban Design Forum is a nonprofit in New York uh, that talks about design challenges to, to issues in the city and actually worldwide. Uh, and I was chosen as a, as a fellow uh, 2019. Wow, that's like three years ago. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was 2019 when I, we actually finished this right at the beginning of the pandemic. So we had the week, we created like this museum space. So we were gonna have all these like, um, all of our like reports and like visuals up and then like, it was scheduled for April, 2020. So then we had to switch it to Zoom. So it, it, uh, got, it got switched around, but um, this is, um, and I'll put this in the chat now, but this is um, a report that we worked with uh, because we, we were assigned to look at urban heat. Um, and is everyone familiar with the urban heat island effect or has anyone heard about extreme heat in cities? Uh, does anyone want to share about, like quickly. I'm not, if, no, if you don't want to, it's fine. But basically cities have like, they're hotter than, um, than rural areas. And that's, that's true worldwide. And it's a real problem in the United States just basically because um, it affects minorities at a much higher rate. So most of the deaths are, are gonna come from minority populations, specifically black, um, black people of black, like African descent in the United States, African Americans. Uh, and I'm from Chicago where we had a terrible heat wave when I was a little kid that killed like 800 people in a week. And to put that in context, there's usually like maybe 400 deaths a year from heat and extreme heat is the most deadly, um, deadly natural disaster. But Chicago, like we just had this, I remember it. I almost like, I, I almost died in it. So it's really, uh, an issue that I thought about a lot. So I was really glad to, to actually bring my personal experience to this project and to work with a group of about 20, like this is all the people, but like uh, about 25 other people who are from the design field, uh, from, the, from the policy field, um, like architects, planners, like all these, all these different people um, to work on this issue because um, like climate change is a transdisciplinary issue. So we have to look at it we can't just say like, oh, we can tech our way out of it. We can build our way out of it. Um, like we can policy out, like, no, you have to work. Everyone has to be on board with this. So um, I think a real, a real big part of the work is looking, is being like very intentional about being in, interdisciplinary. Um, and even if like some people don't like have 
like a design degree, they can still contribute to this process. Um, and like there are some people, um, myself included, who don't have formal design degrees, but we worked, we did, we did iterations, we did design sprints, we basically did everything that you do working with because they wanted to make sure the team was balanced with both designers, policy, academic, whatever. Um, so yeah, this is, I think this is the most, um, this, this really like condenses the sort of work I do, the intersection of design, policy, and sustain and like climate change and um, environmental justice. Uh, but I also, um, yeah, I mean, I, I do a lot of other stuff, but I think that's probably the most relevant to anyone. So yeah, I'm open. For, I know we have our next activities. Hopefully I didn't talk too long. No, that was perfect. Um, so thank you, Mike, for sharing yeah, parts of your practice with us. So next we're going to actually go into breakout rooms. Um, hopefully you had a chance to read Mike's uh, story before you got here, but there is a link to their member story in the agenda, if that's something that you want to check out. Also in the agenda under the breakout section, there is a link to um, a Jamboard that we'll be working with. This is a small group today, so just to make sure that the conversations are full, I think we'll do just two breakout groups, three people each. Um, and the first thing you're gonna do is just introduce yourselves, what are your names, pronouns, where you based, what is your practice? And then we have a list of questions that you can work through. Um, these are just something to get you started as a guide. Um, but yeah, we're curious also about your questions at the bottom of the agenda, pretty much the last page, you'll see, um, just a list where you can start to note questions that come up in these conversations for Mike, or just questions to discuss during the, uh, the Q and A time slash like discussion time. So there's a link on every Jamboard to that, um, to just collect your answers and get things out there initially. Um, that you can add sticky notes to the Jamboard. So I mean, I went a little fast on that. Um, under the arrow key, the select key, there is a sticky note um, option. And to create a sticky note, you just click that, type something in and hit save. And that sticky note will appear on the board. You can just click directly outside of this box. Um, and click directly on the sticky note to move it. So if it feels good to just take a second and uh, to, to throw out some ideas and thoughts on sticky notes, you're welcome to do that. We are going to do that for about 10 minutes. Um, and then I'll bring y'all back in the room. One thing to note is that closed captions do not carry over into the breakout room. So if you're using um, closed captions during this time, you can stay in the main room and we can continue the conversation here. Um, another thing to consider is just like uh, conversations around your personal um, relations to environmental justice and maybe the things that you felt an intersection with in Mike's practice as well. That can also be a great conversation starter. So yeah, I'm gonna send everybody into the breakout rooms and we will see you in 10 minutes. Everyone, welcome back. Um, so yeah, I hope conversations were good in the breakout room. We're about to enter our Q&A portion. Um, if you want to take a moment to write your questions in the chat or in that document, I'll be reading out any written questions for Mike. Um, if you just want to share what you're speaking about in the breakout room, any questions that came up over audio, you can also do that. Hopefully this can be a good conversation um, versus just like a Q&A back and forth. So yeah, if someone asks something and you feel uh, you wanna kind of piggyback off of that or get more context, feel free to also jump in in that way. So does anybody have any questions over audio while, before I get started reading? Yeah, my team with Sachi, we were talking about the Jemez principles of democratic organizing. And Mike, we were wondering, um, like the, the document that I found has the principles, but not really any examples for like tactics and tangible things, activities, methods that you can use. So I'm wondering if 
you can share from your experience um, using these principles with your team and on the projects that you've worked in, how, how do these principles get actualized? All right, th yeah, th yeah, you're right. Uh, thanks for the question, thanks for coming. And um, yeah, they are very broad. <laughs> So it's not giving you like a lot of directions, just like you should, you should have these things in mind uh, when you're doing any sort of community work. But for us at the Tishman Center, that means in a very practical way, like for instance, we, if we, so let's say I, we see something and it's like environmental justice disaster in Texas, uh, waste, I don't know, like pollution, something like, and then it's not like we would go and be like, reach out to the community partners there and be like, hey, do you need our help with any research? Like, do you need us to like they like to make a case or anything? Like, no, they it's like they come to us. So we will never, we don't go around soliciting um, any sort of research work. We basically let any community come to us and then we treat each other as equals. So we are not, we are not acting as if we are um, experts. We like we are we are treating our community part, we are like seeing our community partners as peers. Um, and we like um, it also is tied to the sort of research I was trained in and I think my boss well she trained me so yes I guess it would be the sort of research she's trained in. Um, are you all familiar with PAR or um, participatory action research? Has anyone heard about that? Oh yeah Victoria if you want to <laughs> illuminate everyone. Uh, yes that I've heard of them and I know they're really cool and some of them are members of the network. So that's my main knowledge of them. I know that's not very helpful. Well, participatory action research is a methodology, methodology of research where you could, that you conduct again as a peer to, the, to whoever you're working with. So it's, it's not like you're saying, I am a scientist, let me share my knowledge with you and then I have this relationship where I'm over whoever I'm working with. Again, we want to see each other like eye to eye um, and listen as partners. And I think Hamez is mostly about listening. Like it's mostly about like building relationships and like deep relationships with communities so that they trust you. And then when they let you know, hey, um, we're trying to get this policy passed, but we don't know how to like, we don't have the numbers to give to the elected official. Can you help us with that? So uh, if you look at our uh, research and practice page, we have a bunch of our um, projects and these are all done in that way where the community member approaches us and we, we treat like we, we are in a partnership. We're not, we're not, um, yeah, we're, we're basically like seeing eye to eye. I hope that answers the question, but that's base, that's how um, the Hamez principles, I think, in our practice, like that's how it plays out uh, where I work. I do have a follow up. So, are they um, like positioned as something that's kind of open source because of the like broadness of them? And then also, I mean, it sounds like even with the participatory action research framework that like there are intersections between the DJM principles, these principles. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to how you see those things start to intertwine or come into play and kind of support each other or question each other throughout your process. Uh, let me see, the first question was um, about Hamez, the Hamez principles. Uh, yeah. I don't know why they're so broad. Like they, they're just, uh, I know one of my colleagues learned, like, went to some really uh, instructive thing about them, and I think we say them wrong, but I think it's not Hemez, it's like Hemesh. Um, but anyway, she, like, explained it to us, like, the history of it, um, which, I, yeah, I think it came, it came out of, like, uh, yeah, Demo yeah, democratic organizing. I think it was environmental justice people, like, back in the 90s. I may be wrong about that, but... Um, yeah, so that's where it comes from. And I think the way we try to integrate it at my job or, or with the work I do is the what we were initially started as um, by an architect, Joel Towers, who was the executive dean of Parsons at the new school for 10 years. And he wanted to create the center to do something with like 
design and environment and um, policy. I think it was more scientific based. It was more, it wasn't like, it was more design and policy. So it was like, how can we design our ways out of this using social, using social justice principles, but not really that strong, to be honest. Uh, and then in 2016, uh, but the center had run dormant because Joel was busy running a, a college. So uh, he couldn't run a college and like, do all this other stuff and be an architect. So, uh, and he still does too much, honestly, if you ask me. But um, like he, he uh, in 2016, there's this uh, environmental justice lawyer, Michelle DePass, who worked at the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States. Uh, and she start, I think she's one of the founding members of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Um, she was brought in to be the dean of Milano, um, the school I graduated from at the new school. And she took over the Tishman Center. So, and then she, since she is from the environmental justice movement, she was like, anything this center does has to be ingrained with environmental justice. Like we love the design part. Uh, we love the policy part, but we really have like this, like justice has to be the number one thing and the lens that we look at all of these issues for, um, because otherwise there's no way you can have a truly equitable and sustainable future and not even sustainable. I don't even like that word, but like you can't really confront the climate crisis, but with technology, um, it's not something that you can just like, we, we can't just suck all the CO2 out of the air because you know, if we do that, then we'll put it right back up there. Like we have to be more transformative and we have to move toward it. Um, and this, this term is used, I can explain it later if anyone has questions, but I'm about to use this term, um, uh, just transition, which, which has a multitude of meanings. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that term. I'm, I'm guessing some of you are, but the way that works, um, it, it really involves in either way, from the labor standpoint or the environmental justice standpoint, it really involves um, having a radical transformation in the way we, we, we operate our society and really taking into account the voice of everyone, not, not just a few people, but everyone has to be pretty much uh, on board. You said that term was just transition, just so. Yeah, yeah just transition. Okay, awesome. Um, does anybody have any questions or follow-ups? I have a question. Thank you for sharing, Mike, and for being here. Um, in thinking about, I guess, in building on that, can you talk about, I guess I just, um, challenges, but I guess in thinking about the organizations that you work with, are there groups that like you say yes to everyone? Are there groups that you like choose because you know that they have a working practice that aligns with like how I guess how are you working through that process? And if and I guess if they don't, how are you supporting them in in engaging with these principles if that's not the perspective that they're already coming with? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. That's a really good question. And thank you for coming uh, again. Um, so the way we, I think the way we do it is through that deep relationship building that I, um, that I talked about. So the other director of the Tishman Center has been an environmental activist her whole life. And she knows people all across the world. Uh, and that's how, and actually Michelle DePass was sort of her mentor and brought her into the center. So like Michelle started working in the center and she was like, well, environmental justice is important. I need to bring in someone that like, that that uh that is that knows environmental justice back and forth. So um, she brought in Ana Baptista, who was I think she met her. I think they met because Ana was protesting her or something. Or she's she was like literally in grad school and um, yeah. I think it's when Michelle worked for the EPA and then and then like Ana was like protesting in her office or something for environmental justice. And then she ended up becoming like she it's like it deep in her blood like that's what she does like all day is environmental justice. But she's also a professor and also a, a, like a national policy expert like we're working on all these things like the justice 40 initiative. Uh, we were working with the White House we were working with all these um, groups and we're part of these networks. Uh, and I think Anna and Michelle were really like the key to those networks so that's how we got. Um, evolved in that movement. And so when most people approach us, 
it's through the movement. Like we don't, I don't like, I don't think it's very often that we'll have like a big green want to work with us because uh, they have their own research divisions. Um, like we'll partner with them on certain things, but we won't like, we won't partner with them like in terms of doing research for them. Um, but like it's, it's you because it's usually, yeah, we usually want to work with groups that align with our principles. I think even with our vendors, like I'm trying to get us to use vendors that align with our principles at the school. Um, and like within our center, I certainly do that. When I try to, when we, when we hire, when we do everything, we try to align that with our principles and make sure that um, we're really trying to be very representative and we're looking at everything from that social justice standpoint um, throughout like I, I want to like if it was up to me like one of one of my I mean my job is kind of trying to change the culture of the university I don't I don't think they like that but like I think we really have to look at things through this environmental justice lens um, and to let people know that like we we actually mean what we say we're doing like we're not just we're not like just you know like oh we're just gonna take oil money to like to like do research it's like no we would never put ourselves in that position like it it would be um unthinkable like we like even like two weeks two weeks ago we did like this zoom thing it was two truths and a lie and um and anna my uh my boss who i was talking about like one of her things was that she dated someone like an exile like someone that worked for exile when she was like younger and so me and um, my other boss, we guessed that was the truth. And she was like, no, like, why are you kidding me? Like, I, would not, like, I wouldn't even touch a person that works at Exxon. So I was like, so it's like really ingrained in the culture of the, um, the organization. Um, and, it's, and it's ingrained, I think, in a lot of the staff. Uh, I guess I would say I'm part, a part of the environmental justice movement as well, but like not as, not as deep as Anna. Okay, cool. Um, does anybody else have any questions? All right, we can always come back and yeah, feel free to add them in the chat or after I ask a question, if you wanna hop on the audio and do that, you definitely can. Um, so the first question on the list is, just can you speak to the collaboration process um, for the HEAP project? And were community members and stories used as sources uh yeah thanks for that question um so yes yes to both uh it, i mean not yes to both. one of them was like a, the process but yes we did so a lot of this work was us going to communities uh like actually like different neighborhoods in around new york city because we wanted to understand the problem from a comprehensive as comprehensive a um as comprehensively as possible. And our team was, like I, I mentioned earlier, I touched on, it was very interdisciplinary. So it would be like an architect, an architect, a landscape architect, an urban planner, um, and then like a policy person. Although I think I was the only person like, like me in that fellowship because I, I wasn't, I didn't work for like a policy place. I think I was the only person in academia. Um, and uh, I think I was, yeah, I was the like the only black man like there too, which was also kind of weird. Uh, but that happens a lot, unfortunately. But the team was very diverse. Like I, I wasn't the only black person. I was just the only black uh, male identifying person uh, in the fellowship. So, um, but it, there is a lot of time I walk into spaces, I am the only one there. Um, or like when I go into a Zoom, it's like 49, 49 people that don't look like me. Uh, deciding they don't want to talk about environmental justice or like they don't want to talk about racism that month because it's um because they want to talk about the budget or something so it's it's stuff like that that happens in this work um but yeah with the process we really did go out to every like our team went out to all these different neighborhoods um so like we basically sacrificed our summer so if you ever are thinking about if you ever want to do the new york's uh udf forefront fellowship just realize like every weekend you're going to be going to like some far off part of the city that you've never been to and being there all day on Friday and then Saturday um, and then spending like the all of July and all parts of August locked in a room writing but it was really worth it and it was really really great that I got to work with these design people um, and learn from them 
but also it's weird. I educated them on a lot of stuff. Um, I don't know how many people here are in the U.S. or have heard of rent lining. Um, has it, or have you all heard of that practice? Uh, so there is like I I we I remember this. We were in um we were learning about environmental justice and like the history of uh basically like the history of like racism and environmental justice because they're very closely tied in the United States unfortunately and we there was a thing about redlining and I was there with all these urban planners like all of these like arch landscape architects these people that were like they were interested in doing environmental justice work that's why they were in this fellowship and they like none of them had heard of redlining <laughs> like it was like it's like 24 other people they'd never heard of it some people weren't from the United States so like I was like okay that makes sense but a lot of them were born and raised in the U.S. They were like, I've never heard of this. And this was like this design thing that was talking about environmental justice. And then like someone, someone like, um, like one of my friends, he's like, man, you should be leading this tour. And I was like, no, you should be the one leading this tour. I shouldn't know more about urban planning and how cities were put together than you do. And I was like, that's ridiculous. Like you're like, so it's, um, yeah, like it's, it's, it's really weird that like, like a person like me was able to work with these people and educate them about something I'd never studied as urban planning, but that I knew all about. Like it's, and I think that's really why you should really think about when you're working with any community um, to talk to the people in that community because they are experts in that community. Like they know what's going on there, um, and they could they could explain it, and they've they've lived there much longer than you. So I think that's really important when doing any sort of work when you're going into communities that you're not familiar with. Thank you so much. That was an amazing answer. Um, and I think the next question actually segues in a really nice way. We have about five minutes left for questions. Um, but how did your, um, and you've talked about this a little bit, but how did you find your experience as uh, being someone not trained in formal design versus those who may have been trained in formal design? For example, I'm in the same position and find it difficult at times to validate the information an experience that I know or have. Um, so I haven't really had that issue because I'm always willing to learn. I'm always, I'm able to learn things quite thoroughly and, and quickly. And like, the, I think the only person where that gives me an issue about this is one of my friends who I've known for the longest. Like he's really upset about it. <laughs> um, because he would, I don't know. I actually don't know why. Um, he's he has a degree in he has like a uh, what is it like um he's like an engineer and he has like a master's in design. And he was like, you can't do design. Like you have a psychology degree. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> um, but I've it's it's interesting because I've always had like a very artistic eye for things. Like in fact, uh, like I'm a photographer and, and a documentary filmmaker as well. Like I used to draw and paint, but then like I got carpal tunnel and I can no longer like hold a pencil for too long, but I still see things the same way. And my, I think my family thought I was going to go to some sort of design field. And I really did think about going into that before I like didn't. So it's something I've always done. And um, like I can talk to designers also because like I said, in my master's degree, we did a lot of design work in that degree, even though it's policy, but we did a lot of policy design from a design standpoint. Uh, and then I also took a ton of urban design classes. So I did learn design. I, I, it's not like I don't, I just don't have a degree in it, um, but I did learn design. And I think a lot of designers, unfortunately, don't learn how to do things in a transdisciplinary way. Like they just know their specialty or what they can do. Um, and not, and they, and sometimes they aren't even interested in what, what other people, what other like, um, people can do inside this like space. So like you, you can't, like I said, you can't just solve things by building things. You can't just solve things by having like someone that's like, you can't like graphic design away climate change and racism. It's like, you have to have a bunch of different people that have all these skills and bring them together and like to fill in those gaps. Um, so no, I, it never really was an issue for me. Um, and I think we got to learn from each other. Uh, I, I would say at an equal level. All right, so we have time for one more question and I wanna open it up before I read this question. 
Does anybody have anything they want to add or ask? Okay, cool. Um, so, and I think you may have already answered a little bit of this, but what does some of your work at the Tishman Center look like on a day to day? Um, and are there any projects that you're just excited about right now? Oof, day to day meetings, <laughs> lots of lots and lots of meetings. Uh, this week is light. I usually, I think, have eighteen to twenty five hours of meetings a week. Um, but outside of that, right now, um, I do a lot of event planning in my job. Uh, so we have some themed events coming up. This is not a plug. I'm just telling, talking about my work. But we have Earth Week, uh, a yearly Earth Week. Actually, yeah, you should check it out. Um, we do a yearly Earth Week celebration where we have a bunch of events around environmental justice. Um, and it's like usually themed. So uh, the theme this, the th funnily enough, I, I did not plan this, but the theme this year is art design and democracy. So um, we're, we're trying to have stuff. I can give you some sneak previews if you want. We're trying to talk a little bit about like designing um, the streets of New York in a just way. Uh, so I'm working with the School of Constructed Environments, the dean of that school. Um, and then we're gonna do a, a, an event around music, food, and the environment. So I've been wanting to do some more music-based events. So I'm working with um, two of my colleagues, one's a musician, one's a um, critical geographer uh, that loves music. Um, and I'm doing something else, I can't remember what it is. But um, yeah, that's what I'm working on, like a lot of that. Like, so it's like, really it's meetings and talking to people, but then I'm also managing, uh, are you all familiar with AC Stars? Has anyone heard of that? Has everyone heard of LEED, like USGPC LEED, like the building? Um, so STARS is basically the equivalent for institutes of higher education. It's almost the exact same thing. Uh, so I am managing that process as well. Uh, I've been, yeah, I started like, a year ago uh, and it's just me and like two people so we have to gather all the sustainability information about the university and like like analyze it and then um, put in a report so that that process has taken a lot of my time and then we're all then I also am mentoring students um, I manage like staff um, like I actually helped build our website with uh, and also too so we like a, another Design Justice Network uh, group. Yeah, like we, they, they, I worked with them to build our website. Uh, I basically run the website, uh, do our social media. I have like 15 jobs. So I'm trying to, like we're trying to hire some more people so that I maybe have 10 jobs <laughs> instead of 15. <laughs> but um, no, there's not like any, any days that are the same. It's a lot of meetings, it's a lot of talking to people, a lot of administrative work, but it is interesting. And I do get to, I have quite a bit of freedom in what I can do. Um, so, and, and I have found more ways to like read about design, incorporate my, I get, get some design education at Parsons because it's free for me. So I'm like, why not? Uh, but yeah, that's, that's my um, day to day at work. All right, cool. Thank you, Mike, so much for your presentation, for being here, your practice and your day to day seems so rich and full of like interdisciplinary intersections, which for me is like the dream. <laughs> so yeah, we really appreciate you sharing. Thank you everyone for coming. Um, one thing that I want to do before uh, we go is just thanks Lydia Hooper, who is a member of our comms team. They have been facilitating these interviews um, and volunteering to do so. If you are interested ever in a member story, um, there is an email for Lydia in the agenda. We are always looking um, for people to share um, and do these story sessions with. So yeah, if that's something you're interested in, please feel free to reach out or reach out to the Design Justice Network uh, email. We also love feedback. So if you have any ideas on these sessions um, or would like to get involved with planning these sessions, just let us know. Yeah, have a good night. And yeah, thank you guys for coming again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.